Joshua. We'll be in the book of Joshua. If you're a guest here at Collierville First Assembly, we welcome you. Glad you were here. After service, we'll have someone at the back of this table, uh, stage right at the back of the auditorium. And uh, if you'll stop by there, uh, they'll have a gift that we'd love to put into your hand just to say thank you for worshiping with us. And uh, we trust that the Lord led you here today. God knows in advance who needs to be in a particular service to hear a particular message or even to experience from the presence of the Lord during worship. The Lord knows in advance. It went by accident. You didn't wake up today and go, I think I'll go to Cairoville First Assembly today. No, God preordained for you to be here today. There's a plan and a purpose. If you have your Bibles, you're in the book of Joshua. Now, as you're turning there, let me remind you that last week we talked about awakening the dream. Awakening the dream. And how many people have received dreams from the Lord only to have a portion of that dream go dormant and seemingly dead. But the Lord wanted me to remind you last week that the dream is not dead, it's just resting, and it needs to be awakened. There is a divine moment, there is a divine plan and a divine timetable in which God brings to pass the dreams and the visions that he has for his people. You see, the promises of God are in him, yes and amen. He who promised is faithful. If the Lord gives you a dream, if the Lord has spoken to you something, it will come to pass. God does not start something and then not bring it to a completion. That which began a good work in you, he will bring it to a completion because all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. And so we are to awaken the dream. But this week the Lord began to deal with me about if the dream has been awakened, then now is that divine moment, that divine time that we need to put things in motion to acquire the dream. There's a difference between dreaming a dream, awakening the dream within our spirits, and acquiring that which God has ordained for us. And so today we're going to talk about acquiring the dream. Now we're going to look at Joshua chapters 1 through 6. Not all today. Can I get an amen? But we are going to go through Joshua chapters 1 through 6. We'll hit the highlights. Now the book of Joshua, they, the Israelites, are on the verge of conquering Canaan. That is a dream that the Israelites had for centuries. It goes all the way back to Abraham and the book of Genesis. Now, I know you're in Joshua, but I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 9. It should come on the screen. Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Now, the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morhe. And the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there on the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going still to the south. So all the way back to Genesis 12, the Lord spoke to Abram, told him to leave his father's house, to leave his country and so forth, and to go to a place that the Lord would show him. When he got to the Canaan land, and as he walked through the Canaan land, the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. There the dream came from God. It was not of Abraham's uh, devising. He didn't make this up. This came from God, that God was going to give Abram's descendants the land of Canaan, also known as the promised land. Now, if you follow the historical record, you will realize that that dream went through periods of dormancy. 
But the Lord always took great care to awaken the dream within his chosen people. And now, in the book of Joshua, it is a divine time. It is a divine moment that God is getting ready, not only to awaken the dream within his people, but they should go and acquire the dream that God gave in Genesis chapter 12. The same is for you and I. If you are born again, then you are the chosen of God. You didn't choose God. God chose you. You did not wake up one morning and go, you know, today's a great day to get saved. No, the Holy Spirit had been after you and brought you to the person of Jesus Christ. He said, I've chosen you and I've ordained you and appointed you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And so we are the chosen of God. And as children of God, as the chosen of God, we have dreams that have been deposited within our spirit. There are things that God is wanting to accomplish in you, and there are things that God is wanting to accomplish in the church. And as we go through life, there are periods in which that dream goes through dormancy, does it not? But then the Holy Spirit breathes on you and awakens the dream within you. And that's what happened to us last week. And today I stand before you and say, time is short. Listen to me. Time is short. The Lord is going to return at any moment. And now is a divine moment. It's a divine time for you and for this church to acquire the dream that God has given you and the dream that God has given Cairoville First Assembly. But it doesn't just happen. God didn't say, here's Canaan. They had to go and conquer Canaan. The dream, or realizing the dream unfolded as they walked out the will of God conquering Canaan. So it is for you and I. Our dreams become a reality, but not overnight. They unfold throughout our life as we follow the will of God. And so here we are in Joshua chapter 1. Moses is dead. Joshua is now the leader of Israel. As a matter of fact, Moses was involved in that process. Before he passed away, he laid hands on Joshua and he prayed for him and transferred the the mantle of leadership to him. And in that moment, God spoke to Joshua in Joshua chapters 1 and gave us some very important information. Look at it. Joshua 1, verses 2 and 3. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am given to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot would tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Now, notice the language here. God said, in effect, I've already given you the land, but you have to go and possess it. I've already given it to you, but you have to go get it. And that's the way God works. God gives you dreams. God has a plan and a purpose for you. It's already yours. But he doesn't just hand it to you. You have to go and possess it. And you have to exercise faith. God wants us to have faith in him. And so there is a divine plan for you. And there is a divine dream for you. And there's a divine dream for this church. And God has already given us our Canaan. It already belongs to us. Everywhere that the soles of your foot tread, God has already given you that place. God has already given you that dream. God has already given you that influence. God has already given you the provision. But you have to get up and go get it. And so we have to be like Joshua. If you read the rest of chapter 1, God says, only be strong, be courageous. And so I stand before you today and say, be strong, be courageous. It doesn't matter what the outside circumstances look like right now. God said it belongs to you. Just have faith and carry it out. Now, as I've already mentioned, the dream doesn't just happen. He doesn't just give it to us. It unfolds throughout our life as we walk out the will of God. But now, there are some things that we can put into motion that will help us acquire the dream. And so today, that's what we're going to start talking about. Things that we can put in motion that will help us acquire the dream that God has awakened within us. Number one, position yourself. Position yourself. Joshua chapter 3. See, we've already made it through Joshua chapters 1 and 2. Can I get a witness? Told you it wasn't going to take long. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning 
And they set out from the Akasia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. And so we see in Joshua chapter 3 that the Israelites moved from where they were camped and they went to the banks of the Jordan River. And so this tells us that if we're going to acquire the dream, we first have to position ourselves to acquire the dream. That's exactly what Israelites did. They were at one place, and they got up, and they moved, and they went to the banks of the Jordan River simply because God said they were going to have to cross the Jordan River before they could accomplish or acquire their dreams. And so it is with us. Listen, where you are physically is extremely important in acquiring the dream that God has for you. Many of you know that I was once a youth pastor at this church. And there was a time where me and the the senior pastor that I served, uh, we were praying and and believing God that we were going to plant a church out of here, out of Cairo First Assembly. We were going to be over in Fayette County, east of here. And we went through all the hoops that the Assemblies of God makes you do before you can, you know, plant a church. And I never will forget, I had went to my final meeting in Nashville, where our headquarters is, or district state headquarters, and got the stamp of approval from the Assemblies of God. I hit I-40, heading west, coming back to Memphis. And as clear as day, the Lord said, don't plant the church. And I was like, man, I read all these books. Okay, I had to go to three hours of psychological evaluation. And I passed. I know you don't believe that, but I did. I'm not as crazy as you thought. I mean, you know, I think of all the time and, 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 and the prayers and the investment that the lead pastor at that time had made me and in, in this process. <laughs> Do not, and I never forget, I, I drove straight to the church. The pastor was here, walked in, I said, I know this is crazy. This is what the Lord told me. And he leaned across his desk and he said, the Lord said the same thing to me. We're getting ready to go to minister's retreat. We, as you know, we try every year to go to Gallaberg, Pigeon Forge, staff, ministers, and have services. And he said, we're getting ready to go to Pigeon Forge. Put it on hold. We'll pray about it. And we'll come back. God will give us clarity. We go to East Tennessee. Come back. This is, this is in the days of answering machines. Come home, and there was a message on my answering machine from a church down in Louisiana saying, hey, somebody told us your name, they turned in your name, thought you might be a good fit for our church. Would you consider at least talking to us about coming and pastoring this church? So I went and talked to my pastor. I didn't do anything that he didn't know about. But I went and talked to my pastor, and I said, you think this is it? He said, go check it out. So I go. And the Lord opened the door, and we were pastoring our first church. 28, 29 years old, thought I knew everything, knew absolutely nothing. But that was God's plan for me. I grew up real quickly. I'm still growing. But that was a learning curve. And that began the process of God bringing us back here to Cairo First Assembly as a lead pastor. And I won't bore you with stories after stories, but God did a work in that church, and God did a work in me in that church. Where you are is extremely important and acquiring the dream. So make sure that you're in the right place. Now listen to this. They banked there three days. Just because there's a waiting period in your life doesn't mean that you're not in the right position. Sometimes you just have to wait. The Lord had put it in my heart. The Lord had put it in Kelly's heart to be at this church years and years and years ago. But there had to be a waiting period. And there had to be moving. There had to be learning and growing. And just because it took years for us to come back doesn't mean that we weren't in the will of God. It just simply means we had to be in the right positions along the way 
before we acquired the dream. So it is with you. So you can be in the right position. You think, well, nothing's happening. We're just kind of hanging out. Hang out. No better place to hang out than by the Jordan River. No matter if it seems like nothing is happening physically or in the natural, trust me, things are happening in the spirit. Things are happening supernaturally, and God is doing the work in you. And if God's not doing the work in you, then God's doing the work on the other side of the Jordan so that whenever you cross it, they're ready to receive you. So position yourself to acquire the dream. And while you're there, sanctify yourself. Remember, Joshua sent the, the, the people through the camp and said, hey, sanctify yourself for tomorrow. God's going to do a miraculous work. The word sanctify, set apart. Of course, if you go back and read Exodus, you read Deuteronomy. I mean, there were times they sanctified themselves. They washed their clothes. They, they washed their bodies. They went through ceremonial cleansing. They abstained from certain things because there was a, there was a sacred thing that was about to happen. And, and so whenever you're waiting, sanctify yourselves. Set yourself apart for the purposes of God. Don't get caught up in the profane. Instead, stay holy and humble before God, and God will do a work in you. Number two, if you want to conquer or, or acquire the dream, the number two, determine to overcome your obstacles. Determine to overcome your obstacles. Look in Joshua chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the time of harvest that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down to the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground, and to all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. And so if you want to acquire the dream, not only do you have to position yourself, but you have to determine to overcome your obstacles. Now overcoming your obstacles has to be tied to the Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark? In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was that box that was overlaid with gold. And if you took the lid off of the box, it contained a copy of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded that proved that Levi was to be the priestly tribe, and then a jar of manna. That's a testimony, as a reminder, as a witness that God rained down manna in the desert to feed them as they traveled. And if you were to put the lid back on the box, there were two angels that, uh, they're called cherubim, and they face each other, and their wings went this direction. They touched each other. And the priest would sprinkle blood in between those cherubims on top of the lid, and that was called the mercy seat. And the idea was that when the priest went in, remember, this is the time when they had the tabernacle or, or a temple, if it was a physical structure. If not, it was a tabernacle. It was like a tent they could set up, tear down as they traveled had a huge curtain that separated the most holy place from the holy place. And the most holy place was this Ark of the Covenant. They could go back there and, uh, one time a year and they could sprinkle blood upon that mercy seat. And the idea is that when God looked down and he saw Ten Commandments and he saw his righteous standards, but then as he looked out at the nation of Israel, he realized that they were a bunch of wicked people and they couldn't live up to the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, they were sinful, just like you and I. We can't keep up the Ten Commandments. But when he saw the blood of Jesus Christ and there was mercy and there was grace and there was forgiveness because he saw the blood of the Lamb that had been sacrificed rather than the broken commandments. And so it is for you and I today. We have an ark. It's no longer a box. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ark of the believer. And we can't live up to God's standards, but we don't have to. That's the point. Whenever we come to Jesus Christ, he sprinkles blood of the Lamb of God that had been sacrificed for our sins so that when God looks down, he doesn't see my brokenness. Instead, he sees grace and mercy and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that ark represented God's presence and glory in the old covenant. Today, Jesus Christ represents God's presence and glory in the new covenant. Joshua tells the children of Israel that they're going to have to cross this Jordan River because the first city they have to take in order to get, acquire their dream is Jericho. But there was a Jordan River. So they had to overcome the obstacle. 
when the ark steps into the Jordan, or the priest carrying the ark, when they step into the Jordan River, the waters are going to wall up, and you're going to cross over on dry ground. Now, here's something interesting about the Jordan River. The Jordan River is a relatively small river, width-wise. Except during harvest time. Did you notice that little parentheses in the text that we read? It said, in the harvest, it swells up. Well, what happens is during harvest time, the Jordan River swells, it overflows its banks, and it floods the entire region. That's the time that Israel was told to cross the Jordan River. They didn't cross it with just a little river. They crossed it in harvest time when it had swollen, overflowed its banks, and was flooding the region. You know what that tells us? Whenever it is time to harvest your dream, what is normally a little obstacle swells up and it becomes a really big obstacle. Why? Because the enemy swells up to keep you from harvesting the dream that God has put into your heart. But my Bible tells me, when the enemy comes in, then like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against him. Whenever the presence and the glory of God, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, steps into the Jordan River, then the waters are going to cut off. It will divide, and you can cross over on dry ground. The waters will not overtake you. You won't be dragged through the mud, but you're going to come out on the other side because you will conquer your obstacles. But you have to determine to follow the glory of God. You can't just camp out on the Jordan. There comes a time when you've got to get up and cross it. Overcome your obstacles. It's exactly what Israel did. So they, they had this dream that went through going all the way back to Father Abraham. And it would go through seasons of dormancy. And it seems like it had died and then God would raise them up. And then it would go through dormancy and then God would awaken the dream. And here we are in the book of Joshua. Joshua's getting ready to acquire the dream. So they position themselves. They get up and move to the Jordan. Well, there's an obstacle. They determined to overcome the obstacle. They cross the Jordan River, and now they're on the other side. What's next? Number three, build your faith. Build your faith. Listen to this scripture. Joshua chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed for the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. So acquire your dream. As you put things in motion to acquire your dream, position yourself. Determine to overcome your obstacles. Build your faith. Every time you successfully cross an obstacle... You take a memorial with you so that it builds your faith the next time you come to another obstacle. I was fortunate enough when I first started out in ministry that my mentor told me, keep a notebook. Uh, Don't worry, I'm not writing down everything you tell me. But he said, keep a notebook. Number one, Of all the crazy stuff that happens in church, and I got some good ones. I'll tell you about some water baptismal services I've been in. Another thing, keep a record, a memorial of the miraculous things that God has done. Because he looked at me. Now, remember, I'm in my mid to late 20s. He looks at me and he says, because I'm telling you, there is more than one Jordan River in your ministry. And you're going to need to look back at those memorials to realize that if God was faithful then, he is faithful now. 
God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he was faithful to stop the rivers of the Jordan from overcoming you last time, he'll do the same this time. And so here we are in my first church. God has done a miracle. You know, every, every pastor has those war stories, right? You ever hang around preachers? You got war stories. My first, my first church, I take a church that's split, right? The guy, uh, average age of the church was around 62 there was about 32 of us, and that was including me, my wife, Josiah, who was born, and my daughter, who was in the womb. She's a person. Can I get a witness? We're counting everybody. Uh, what? The guy had embezzled something like $60,000 that we could prove. There was more than that, but that we could look at the books and prove. Put out all the equipment of the church. Stole an identity of the secretary and one of the board members. Bought cars through their names. Didn't pay the bills. And guess who got stuck with it? Oh, by the way, the IRS calls the church and says, you, you owe back this and back that from your employees. Yeah. Fun times. Six in the morning, I wake up to beep, beep. What is that? Go outside. And the uh, sheriff's department's trying to re repossess my vehicle because that was the last known address of the previous pastor. So I'm like, no, I'm not him, I promise. Fun times. But you know, during that, God supernaturally opened the windows of heaven over that church. First thing that happened was that the IRS somehow made a mistake. We didn't have to owe all that money. Secondly, the power company calls and says, hey, we just had our books audited. Found out we've overcharged you for like the last four years. So you don't have to pay a utility bill for the next five months. <laughs> you know, when you're in church, that's like $1,000 a month or, or more, you know, when you're talking about heating and cooling a building, especially in Louisiana when it's hot. Um... People not even associated with the church begin to send in money. I'm talking 5000 at a time, 3000 I mean, God just supernaturally opened windows of heaven. So we're writing all this down. Man, this is good. Baptist kid. Come on, Baptist. Gets a hold of a preaching CD. Gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. Within the next few months, he brings over 25 people that are either saved, getting saved, or are being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Overnight, our church almost doubles with people who were on fire, full of the Holy Ghost. And I mean, the story goes on and on, and so we're writing all this stuff down. And then God says, it's time to move. And we're like, oh. You know, right when it starts getting good, right? We thought it was time to come here. It wasn't. We end up in Oklahoma. Now, getting ready to go to Oklahoma. Church plant, here's my instructions. Here's a building. There are some people, 17 of them this time. I'm going down. Either build the church or close it down. I don't care what you do. That's what the district told me. I went, thanks. We get ready to move. Somebody sends a check for $10,000. And, oh, yeah, the IRS calls and says, hey, we noticed on your personal stuff, we messed up, and we owe you thousands of dollars. So me and Kelly are looking at each other going, huh, must be God's will to move. Everything was paid for. We bought a house online that we never even saw to the day we moved in. And there's a prophetic word that came for us to do that. Okay, story after story. By the way, that I didn't have to close down the church. It's still going today. They have a full-time pastor 
and they're supporting missionaries. God has blessed in that church. And I, listen, I'm only saying all this to tell you. I've crossed some Jordan rivers. What about you? Here's what I want to challenge you to do. Write them down. Whether you never stand in a pulpit and tell a crowd, your family will one day read up. Your children, your grandchildren, some of you, your great-grandchildren. When you die, we're going through all your stuff. They come across a notebook. You need, you need to label it, crossing the Jordan. I don't, I don't know. I have a million-dollar inheritance in here for you. It's label it something where they'll read it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just make sure you're not a liar in your death and put, this is spiritual money I'm talking about. And little bitty, you know, the fine print at the end. Anyway. Yeah. Write it down so they'll read it. Because it builds people's faith. I look out in the congregation. See Eva Jo, Gary. Praying and believing God for their second child. You know the story. Eventually comes Gary. Every time I see Gary, it's a memorial. That if God opened up the womb of Sarah opened up the womb of Eva Cho. He can still open wombs today. It's a memorial. See, as a pastor, when I look at you, I don't see just sheep. Well, it depends on who you are. What I see is a memorial. Because I'm privileged to share life with you, so you get to tell me your stories, and I see all God did this for you. God did this for you. And God, and it builds my faith. Every time you cross the Jordan, take a stone with you. Physically, put something in your house if you need to. But most definitely mentally. Make a note. Write it down. Because you think you will remember, but you won't remember. So write it down. So you can know exactly the details. Last, I'll close with this point today. Well, let me go back. Here's a danger. Here's a danger of building your faith with memorials. A lot of people get stuck in the past. When you build your memorial, don't, don't limit God to what he did in the past. You just use it to remind you that if you cross the Jordan that time, you'll cross it this time. Don't, don't put a fence around. You can't fence in God. You can fence in where he's been, but you can't fence him in. It's the same thing with memorial. Build a memorial, but don't think that God's only hovered over that pile of stones. God's done moved on. You've got to follow the glory and the presence of God. But every now and then, look back at that stone. And remember, man, I crossed that Jordan. I crossed that Jordan. I cr God's going to do it again. Lastly, number four, as you put things into motion to acquire your dream, demonstrate your dependency on God. Demonstrate your dependency on God. I'm going to read a lengthy passage of Scripture because it's, it needs to be in its context to understand where we're going. Joshua chapter 5, verses 2 through 9. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. Time out. No need to circumcise somebody twice. Once is good enough. What it means is in Exodus, it was a circumcision as a sign of the covenant. But then as they traveled through the desert, as we shall read, there was a whole generation that were born in the desert that was not circumcised. And so we got to initiate the covenant again. All right, Tommy. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. That's a great name. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way. After they had come out of Egypt, for all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. 
For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. To whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us. A land flowing with milk and honey. The Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Um, in, the he- in the Hebrew, Gal is rolled. And so the double, the double name Gilgal means rolling away, rolling around in circles, keep rolling till it's rolled away from you. So they call the place Gilgal because it's where they were all circumcised and God rolled away the reproach of Egypt and, and, the, and the disobedience of their forefathers in the desert. Now, as we put things into motion to acquire our dream, we position ourselves, we, we de- determine to overcome our obstacles, we build our faith. The next thing that we need to do is that we need to demonstrate our dependency upon God. Well, how do we do that? We do that by removing our flesh from the equation. We have to remove our flesh from the equation. The Israelites circumcised themselves on the plains of Jericho. They had already crossed the Jordan River. They're getting ready to conquer Jericho. They all stop to circumcise the males. Consequently, they were out of commission for a few weeks. And they were vulnerable to attack. But God preserved them. Why? Because they were declaring and demonstrating their dependency upon God. They recognized that acquiring this dream is a God thing. This is a God dream. This wasn't Joshua who woke up in the middle of the night and said, let's go conquer Canaan. No, no, no. This plan unfolded from God. And God said, now it's time to circumcise the males. And so Joshua had to stop and circumcise the males. And God supernaturally preserved them. They could have been wiped out easily. They were all lying on the bed. Unable to fight. But God preserved them. Why? Because they demonstrated their dependency upon God. They removed their flesh as a sign of the covenant saying, God, the battle belongs to you. So it is with us today. As we acquire the dreams that God has put before us, we have to remove our flesh from the equation. We can't conquer our Jordans. We can't conquer our Jerichos. We can't conquer our Canaan in our flesh. The battle is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. And we have to demonstrate our dependency upon him. How do we do that? We circumcise our flesh. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. Paul writes, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. That's what it means to be really circumcised. In the old covenant, it was a sign that a Israelite was in covenant with God. But in the New Testament, circumcision is about the heart and it's cutting away the hardness of our hearts and our flesh. We have no confidence in our flesh. We only have confidence in the cross of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The only way that we can acquire our dreams, the only way that we can do what God has put into our hearts is to circumcise our flesh, get rid of it, and depend solely upon the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be victorious other than coming to faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There's no other way to heaven but by Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be healed than by Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be delivered from your bondages and your addictions but by Jesus Christ. The battle's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. In today's world, in the new covenant, we demonstrate our dependency upon God by placing our faith in the person of Jesus Christ and allowing his spirit to circumcise our flesh, remove our flesh so that we're free to live 
by the Spirit. We trust solely in Him. And yes, that may make you vulnerable, but don't you realize if God be for you, who can be against you? He's on your side. We do things upside down in the kingdom. And he'll be with you every step of the way. We stand to your feet with me this morning. I got much more. We'll, we'll complete it next week, Lord willing. As our musicians come, I just want to ask the church if you'll close your eyes. Again, I, I say this every week. It's not because we do anything secretive here. It's just, I don't want you to concentrate on movement. I want you to concentrate on the Holy Spirit as he's dealing with you. One of the great things about preaching the word of God is that he could take one word, one sentence, one phrase, and use it to minister to somebody on one side of the building and take a complete different word, sentence, phrase, and use it to minister to somebody else on the other side of the building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The time is now. The time is now to acquire the dream. I didn't say it would happen immediately. I didn't say you'd wake up tomorrow and it'd be done. But the time is now to begin to put things in motion. Time is short and the time is now. Your dream will progressively come to fulfillment as you put things into motion. And in order to acquire the dream, we have to position yourself. I, I don't know what that means to you. But you need to put yourself in position as the children of Israel left where they were and camped on the banks of the Jordan River. So you need to put yourself in the right place. Some of you just need to make up your mind. You need to determine to overcome your obstacles. Anything that's from God, that's worth accomplishing, the enemy is going to try to frustrate it from coming to pass. Being a Christian is not for sissies. It's for men and women who exercise faith in Jesus Christ, who are willing to be obedient, even if it doesn't make sense to anyone else. You have to demonstrate your dependency on God. How do you do that? By placing your faith in the person of Jesus Christ and nothing else. I don't know where you are in that process. I don't know what you need to put into practice today. All I know is the Lord told me to tell you it's time. It's time now to begin to acquire the dream. Put things into motion. Some of you need to position yourself. Some of you just need courage to cross the Jordan River. You've been standing on the banks too long. It's time to go to the other side. Some of you need to place your faith in Christ. I'm going to start there. Some of you need to demonstrate your dependency on God by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Is there anyone here today who needs to make Jesus the Lord of their life? He came to this earth, died on the cross of Calvary, was buried in the tomb, and three days later he rose from the dead. He's alive forevermore, seated at the right hand of the Father, and one day he's coming back for all those who believe in him. You've been trusting in the arm of the flesh for too long. And it's why you're still battling your addiction. And it's why you're still battling. Your emotional torment. And the Lord said, now is the time to place faith. And what I accomplished for you on the cross of Calvary. When I said it is finished, everything necessary for godliness came to you through the cross of Jesus Christ. So today, if you need to place faith in Jesus Christ, you need to make him the Lord of your life. You want to know that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. Will you raise your hand right where you are? Say, that's me. I want to be saved. I want, to, I want that peace you're talking about. I want to know.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe some of you just need to declare your dependency on God. Maybe you're saved, but you've lost sight of the cross. You, you, put your, you put confidence in your flesh. You think you could overcome things in your flesh, and you've lost sight of the cross. You're saved. You just lost sight of the cross. Today, I'm calling you back to the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the only means of victory. You must place your faith in Jesus Christ. If that's you, say, you know what? That's me. I, I've kind of lost sight of that, and I need to circumcise my flesh. I need to get rid of it. I need to come back to the basics. I need to focus on the cross again and what Jesus Christ accomplished for me when he rose from the dead. If that's you, will you raise your hand? Say, that's me. I need to place my faith. I need to refocus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen. The rest, if you raise your hand, I want to invite you to come. I want you to invite you to come stand in the front. And the rest of you, I just want to give you an opportunity. I want to open up these altars and let you just come into the presence of God. Some of you need to make a, a physical demonstration from where you are walking up front, see, signifying that you're going to position yourself, signifying that you are taking the steps necessary to acquire your dream. And that by so doing, God is going to give you the faith that you need to cross your Jordan. Come on, if you want to come, if you want to demonstrate that today, you're going to put things into motion to acquire your dream. I invite you to come pray with me at the front of these altars. And if you raise your hand, please come. We want to pray with you about Jesus Christ. These altars are open if you'd like to spend some time praying.
Come on, let's worship for a minute before we dismiss. Let's worship. Yes, Lord. For we are standing in his presence on holy ground. We are standing. Yes, we are.
Amen. Amen. We need to heed that. Praise and worship is our strength. I'm going to go ahead and preach round two. When they got ready to circle Jericho, the praise and worship team was involved. We're going to talk about that next week. So they're going to lead us into worship, but we're going to go ahead and heed what the Holy Spirit is saying now. Some of you, you just need to take a moment to worship God. Don't worry about the clock. If your food burns, it wasn't that good anyway. Just spend time in the presence of God. It's more important. We're going to worship and let the strength of the Holy Spirit come upon you. And some of you, I know when the Holy Spirit gives a message like that, a message in tongues, and there's an interpretation following, it's because there were a few people that didn't respond that you should have, and so I encourage you, come on. You just need to come and get in the presence of God. Just You're just symbolizing that you're getting into position to acquire your dream. It has nothing to do with being saved or not saved. You're just getting yourself into position. In the spirit, you're saying, I'm going to position myself to acquire this dream. Come on, let's spend some time worshiping. You some of you, that Jordan River is flowing. That Jordan River is swelling up. You need to cross over. You need to spend some time worshiping. You need to cross over. As we lift our hands in Don't worry about the swelling. Lord, we lift your when it comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. You will cross on dry ground. Come on, just worship. Shift your focus from the Jordan River to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. On worship. Just raise your hands and worship. As we lift Shift your focus from the Jordan River to the person of Jesus Christ. As we lift your holy name, you deserve the glory. Hallelujah. And
Hallelujah. Hold on. Right, right, right before we worship, we need to call the church together to pray for two people, David Anglin. We need to pray for David Anglin. Number two is baby. Janice Faye Donnelly, we, we, I don't know if you remember several weeks ago, we prayed for a baby that was born who's going to have to have several heart surgeries. The first one is tomorrow morning at 930. We're just going to believe God. 730, I'm sorry. Tomorrow morning at 730. So we're just going to believe God to touch this baby. So Dave Angler, baby, right before we worship. We're going to pray that we're going to worship like it's already done. What do you think? Amen. Father, we come before you. We lift up David Angler to you. We pray, God, you touch his body. We war in the spirit against cancer in Jesus' name. We ask, oh Lord, that this Jordan water, waters that's swelling up in disease and infirmity would be rebuked in Jesus' name. That you would wall off the waters. We pray for healing now in Jesus' name. God, we pray for this baby. God, you must have a We know that every time that you fight a birth of a baby, that's because there's something important that that baby is to accomplish for the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, we war on behalf of this child, and we ask that everything would go smoothly with this surgery. God, we ask that you work a healing, whether it's by miracle or by medicine, God. We pray that this baby would grow to fulfill the purpose that you have in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, here we are. We're still in the vein. We receive what you spoke by the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues today, an interpretation that we are to worship. And so we're going to worship. We're going to bring down every stronghold. We believe that, Lord that you wore on our behalf. We circumcise our flesh and we depend solely upon you. It's not by might or by power, but it's by your spirit, oh God. We declare that today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are you turning?